guess what time it is. This is a world This is a world premiere. This is a world Hey you guys, so I figured it was time for another sit down to have a little watermelon and a little chat. Things have been getting, I feel like things have been getting a little heavy on the channel and I don't want that to be the case. I want, I want us to have fun together. So hopefully this is gonna be a fun chat. Mm -hmm. I wanna thank you guys a lot for some of the feedback that you offered from my last video, Sour Grapes. From my video, Sour Grapes. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, check out the video, Sour Grapes, because I'm not white. Which just kind of looks at, you know, just this idea that I've been accused a number of times by people to be exper experiencing bitterness for not being white. And that's from white people. And y'all, <laughs> You know that's fucked up. That's like a person who, you know, and please don't take this the wrong way, Africans, but it's like a person who, you know, can walk, you know, tell, you know, saying to somebody who is confined to a wheelchair, well, you sound like you're just bitter because you can't walk. Like, would you say that? You wouldn't say that, right? And of course, you know, that, assumes that there is a handicap in our society if you are born black. Is that the case? Are there hurdles that you will have to face if you were born with brown skin, and not just in America, but in the world today. Because when we talk about society under globalization, we have to talk about the world. Or so I believe. But, in case you guys think that I can only talk about race, I want to spend some time in this, in this video talking about marriage. So for those of you who haven't been following, you know, I'm married. I'm not wearing my ring right now. Sometimes you see me wearing a ring, sometimes you don't, but I'm not wearing a ring right now. And that might say something, and it might not. And, uh... Marriage is really interesting. I've been in a, you know, monogamous relationship for going on 23 years now. And we could romanticize the notion of what it means to be married and what it means to be in a relationship and paint it with hearts and flowers. But that's not been my experience. My experience has been that it's hard work it's really hard to be with someone. To really be with someone. Having sex with someone is really easy. You know? And I could be vulgar, right? And, um, having sex is easy. You know? and the rom all the romantic notions of love, that part is really easy, but my experience of being in a relationship, of being with someone, is most of the time you're just occupying the same space. And that might sound horrible, but come on, like I don't spend most of the time walking around thinking, oh, I love my husband so much. <laughs> I don't, it's just not what happens. Most of the time I'm just trying to get through this world on my own. And maybe that has something to do with my experience as an African in the world, or not. And my husband, by the way, is not African. My husband, by the way, identifies as white. So, my husband and I met 
when I was, I was still acting a lot. And I was doing a national tour of a play. And he had seen that play in Chicago. And then later on, he saw that play. So, hey, the students are here. The students are back. So later on, he saw that play again in another city, in the city where we met. And I happened to be sitting in a coffee shop. He happened to come in. We met. We started a conversation. And, you know, one thing led to another. And, um, yeah, there were some... There was some sexual activity pretty early on, but for the most part, our relationship for the first months were just through letters. And so that was kind of romantic. And I think some of that had to do with the fact that I was reading Jane Austen at the time. But, um, yeah. And we would um, visit each other. And a lot of those visits were you know, about having sex. We'd get together, we'd be really excited. It's like, you know, you know, it was about like the thrill, the electricity of getting to see this person that I'm attracted to and, you know, getting to enjoy each other, which is what you do, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe not everyone else, but that's what I like to do. So, we spend this courtship, writing letters, talking on the phone, sometimes going to see each other. And ultimately, we de he decided that he was going to move from the state that he was living in, in the middle of the country, to the state that I was living in on the edge of the country. And at that point, we were in a, what you call, I guess, a committed, committed relationship. But, you know, it's been, it's been challenging to be in a relationship where, you know, the, that electric part of it, that electric impulse part of it, where it's about, you know, having sex with that person <laughs> as much as possible to, you know, having sex with that person sometimes to, you know, going for very long persons where you're not having sex with that person. So when you're not having sex with the person that you're in a relationship, you know, what are you doing? And so then there are some who will probably go on to romanticize it further and imagine that we sit together reading newspapers or talking about things constantly, but in the same way that the physical part of relationship starts to, starts to taper off, perhaps, um, the intellectual part of a relationship can begin to taper off as well. I don't know, maybe not for everyone, but certainly for me. And so you're left with, or I've been left with, being a relationship that I think is extremely rewarding, but not for any of the reasons that I see in the movies. My relationship starts where the movies end. My relationship starts with the boring part. And that's what makes relationships, I think, extremely difficult. Because when there's not the anticipation of the physical and when there's not the looking forward to the next opportunity to engage with that person's intellect. You get to know that person's intellect so well that you're thinking their thoughts before they think them. And that's not, and that's not necessarily always fun. Uh, and often it gets you into trouble. And so, I've talked about marriage in the very general, I haven't talked about the fact that I'm in a queer relationship, so it's two men doing this in a, in a society that's, you know, tolerant of it, but doesn't necessarily embrace it. You know, we encounter a lot of queer phobia. You know, I still, in this day and age, 
meet people who are what you call in the closet because they're just not comfortable dealing with their families because their families say things to them that make them very uncomfortable about who they are, about their identity. So, there's an added challenge in a relationship when you start adding the fact that your relationship isn't, isn't considered mainstream. Your relationship is considered quite, quite out of the ordinary. Although in reality, it's pretty ordinary. There are a lot of relationships where there are two men together. But for some reason, the world continues to see it as something, you know, off. And then you have to consider the fact that he's white and I'm not. And the cultural baggage that we each bring to the relationship. You know, I was actually asked by one of the viewers to talk about this in depth. And so, in some ways that's part of why I'm doing this. I didn't think a conversation about my relationship could happen in five minutes. And I certainly am not going to try that. And I don't think the time that it's gonna take me to eat this watermelon is gonna be enough for me to really get into the the gritty details of what it's like to be a queer man of my age in a relationship with a white man being more and more aware of the structural oppression that people who look like me go through for the benefit of people who look like him. Another thing that I'm really getting kind of tired of is when I make these general statements, I'm making them general for a reason. I'm making them general so that we're not talking about any specific... We're not talking about individuals. We're talking about modes of behavior. We're talking about modes of engagement with society. We're talking about structures of oppression, we're talking about systems that have been put in place to function in very specific ways to benefit some and not benefit others. And whether or not they're put in, spa in place specifically to exploit other people is another question. But certainly we know that the system of race in the United States at least, which was embraced by all of Europe to justify slavery, was put in place at the expense of Africans. There's been no mass movement to undo race. As far as I'm concerned, there's been a growing apathy on the part of people who identify as white to as much as possible shirk their responsibility in terms of their role as beneficiaries in the system of race, the oppressive system of racial subjugation that has been happening in the United States and throughout the world. Because it doesn't just happen to African descendants in the United States, it happens to brown people all over the world. And if you think about that, and if you think about that fact that it's been happening for 300 years, and I'm really gonna direct this question to white people who are paying attention. If the systems of race-based oppression that have been happening throughout the world have been happening for hundreds of years without a mass movement, specifically a mass movement with the participation of white people to specifically undo structures of racial subjugation. Why should anybody <laughs> trust white people? 
it was white people who did it. I don't even want to say it was white people who did it. White was invented as a placeholder, <laughs> as a receptacle for the benefits of racism. White was invented as the receptacle for the benefits, for the exploits of racism. If it happened once, it could happen again. If it was maintained for 300 years, who's to say at any point the group that was responsible could not organize themselves to do it again? And then you look at, you know, what's happening with Donald Trump. And I'm not saying that people who support Donald Trump are automatically racist, but this blind engagement for, you know, for this idea of bringing the United States back to its glory, if you think about that with any care, that means it's gonna require an increase of exploitation. Somewhere else in the world, who's it gonna be? So again, I'm married to this white man understanding that there are traditions of oppressive action. There are, you know, my husband's family owns land. They own land. A fair amount of it. They don't necessarily consider themselves wealthy, but they own land. And to own land when you know that land was taken from indigenous people, not taken from indigenous people in the specific sense because the indigenous people didn't, con didn't have that concept of ownership. But Europeans did have that concept of ownership. And were willing to kill indigenous people in order to satisfy the need for ownership, for increased ownership. And so how can someone who, you know, owns land do that without a deep sense of, <sighs> without a deep sense of, you know, without feeling a sense of moral dilemma about it? And if an individual can own land without any sense of moral dilemma, I have to question. Where is that person's come? Where's that? What is, where are those person's values? And the values that might allow someone to, without any type of moral self evaluation, you know, if that, I, then I have to question that individual. If a person is, is able to and quietly sits back and benefits from structural violence that's happening all over the world, even if that person doesn't feel themselves personally responsible, I have to question that person's <laughs> values. And so the sense that, sense of outrage that I get from people when these questions, they're just questions, are brought up, <sighs> you know, are mind boggling. Yet I'm married to this white dude. And then the last question came up, you know, about his veganism. No, he's not vegan. You know, he tries to be vegan. And I guess he tries to be vegan in the same way that he tries not to be a racist. He doesn't stop eating meat. Now, before I get accused of being a hypocrite, I understand that I benefit from many of the same structural violence that's happening all over the world. I understand that. Likely, I benefit more because I'm married to this white guy 
that certainly shifts my social location to the point that I have access that a lot of people don't have. I get to be on that land. I get to vacation on the lake. I'm not a fool, but these questions still exist. So now I'm in Detroit, in a house that was severely damaged by fire, <laughs> with a group of college students staying with me right now. They're actually helping out right now, clear out some uh, some debris from the house. They're just cl clearing it out. And having them here is great. It's a great, it's a great, uh, it's a great benefit. <laughs> that comes from my social position, right? I have a degree from Yale. I'm not stupid, I understand. So the question is, knowing all those, knowing all of those things and having all of those questions, how do you live? How do you live with yourself? I think there are some schools of thought that say you just kind of shrug it off and say that that's the way it is. But. I don't think that that's the case. I do think talking about these things helps. But at some point it has to go beyond talking. At some point people have to move into action. And really, undergo that, what is it, that radical revolution of values? What is it that Martin Luther King says? I'm terrible that I don't know these things by heart. But a serious shift has to happen. It has to happen. Because all this great stuff, all these benefits, This can't last forever. The world won't support it. And people won't support it. So what do you do? Oh man. Did I do okay? That's it for this video like it if you like it share comment subscribe this is reg signing off love yourself peace and i love myself the world is a ghetto because of me